So welcome to the Shoreline Conversations podcast. Uh, we're really excited to be jumping into this, this new series on our podcast. We're going to be talking about this book, Tactics, by Greg Kukul. And, and it's uh, it's a really interesting book that's uh, really based around uh, the tactics that we take as Christians and uh, when we're getting into conversations about apologetics. And, and a big concept uh, of this book is how to ask the right questions and, and how to engage in conversation through asking questions. And so um, we're really excited about going through this with Pastor Dennis. And uh, this first episode, it's really um, kind of just a, a foundation of the book. And um, it's just like an intro conversation to get us uh, prepared for actually looking at the specific tactics in the week to come. So weeks to come, excuse me. So we're really excited to see how this pans out. And uh, I have a great conversation with Pastor Pastor Dennis. So let's jump into it. So Dennis, it's good to have you back. We're in a different little uh, strain of, of this podcast and uh, I'm really excited uh, about what's to come. But just for those that maybe, uh, you know, didn't see the, the previous podcast or didn't listen to the previous podcast, can you just uh, let us know who, who you are, what you do here at Shoreline and, and uh, kind of how you got interested in this really sure. exciting topic of, of apologetics and, and what we'll talk about with tactics. Sure. Well, it's good to be here, Cole. Um, glad to do this. Uh, love talking about tactics and apologetics. I've been interested in apologetics for a long, long time because I accidentally fell into teaching Bible study weekly here at Shoreline. Years and years and years ago after a conference, uh, I was asked, well, you lead a four-week group uh, using this booklet with guys, and then that's all you have to do, and I did it. I said, sure, okay, if I have to. That was like 16 years ago. (laughs) And when we were done, I prayed. I remember praying, saying, thank you, Lord. It's good to meet these guys and good to be done. And so off we go, amen. (laughs) And I was done, and they said, can we keep meeting? I went, oh, no. Uh. (laughs) There goes Tuesday morning. But I grew to love it, and now I lead two groups. And so over the years, having to prepare for those Bible studies, and I'm not trained Mm -hmm. in teaching Bible. I didn't go to seminary to learn Bible. That isn't the track I took. Um, So I developed my own way of teaching, and in doing so, to prepare for the weekly lessons, I had to, and still do, consult a number of scholars and commentaries and got exposed to the whole idea of there's people who've done a ton of homework. Yeah, yeah on every word in the Bible for yeah. centuries, and, and we can read that material. Mm-hmm. And I began to have this growing fascination with it. This isn't just, I'm believing the Bible because God said, and it's the Bible, so that's that, don't ask anymore. It really became this, this kind of discovery of, there is so much depth and so much background and so much sensibleness, yeah. so much reasonableness to Scripture that I, I grew to love it, and along the way decided to read more and more about why things mean what they do in Scripture, mm-hmm. and who said, and what does the Greek mean, what does the Hebrew mean, yeah. and all that kind of thing. So, And plus, I'm a student of history. I'm not a good student of history, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fascinated by the history of human beings in the world. I really am, yeah. all the way back to the original empires and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. So all that led uh, me to look more and more into what's called apologetics. Mm -hmm. And I've come to understand it as that practice of defending the Christian faith and the Bible against questions that doubt it, that are skeptical, and then also in other scenarios, teaching it, Mm -hmm. teaching what's true about Jesus, the Bible, uh, church history, all those things, current church, how, how church works now. So in my mind, that's apologetics. And then... I developed a friendship with a young man who's now gone home to be with Jesus, yeah. uh, Nabil Qureshi. And his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, was so powerful, yeah, still is. very powerful, yeah. And I got to spend some time with him on fishing vacations yeah, yeah. just by happenstance. And I watched what he did when we would talk to people. Uh, even though we were vacationing, we'd have these conversations with folks. Right. And one particular night, I think I mentioned it in one of the videos, but if I didn't, I'm going to mention it again. (laughs) We were all done fishing. We were hanging out in the pool. And this was 8 o'clock at night. And one of the guys there is a non-believer. Great guy. I've come to know him pretty well. But four of us are floating in the pool. One's a 
a church board leader, I'm a pastor, and the other's Nabil, and the other's this, this fourth guy. And we decided, floating around the pool, let's each take a half an hour and tell our story. Mm -hmm. Everybody else listens. So we're floating around into the starlight on the Sea of Cortez. And then this non-believer starts asking Nabil questions. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by a number of things. Number one, the depth of Nabil's reading. Mm -hmm. He's a true apologist. Mm -hmm. The depth of reading and a base of yeah. knowledge. I don't have that. Yeah. You know, I, I hope to gain it, but I don't. But the other was the gentle, caring manner in which he engaged this guy. Yeah. They talked back and forth for two hours. And I remember we, we got out of the pool at midnight. We were wrinkled. <laughs> <laughs> and my soul was satisfied because yeah. I remember telling my, my friend Rick before we went to bed, I said, something happened in there. Yeah. I witnessed something that just changed something in me. That's how you do it. Yeah. With gentleness and respect, and the other person was engaged. And by the end of the night, the other person wasn't a believer. Yeah. But he, the very next day, he said, that guy's something. And, and he said it in a way that said not only about how he handled the conversation, but the guy as a person had touched him. Yeah. He developed a, a great fondness for Nabil and Nabil for him. And the guy to this day still isn't quite a believer, mm -hmm. but he's much closer so all that really intrigued me. Yeah. And combine it with uh, reading The Case for Christ yeah, Lee by Strobel. Lee Strobel, who's yeah. been to Shoreline, and reading Mere Christianity, yeah. which I think every Christian should never stop reading. Yeah. You it's should always be book. on one page or another in that book. I was drawn to go online and watch apologists, people whose profession yeah. it is to teach about the faith and about the Bible and the truth and veracity of it, mm -hmm. and then to defend it yeah. against skeptics' questions. Yeah. So that then led me to, in my YouTube uh, perusal of apologists, <laughs> I come across this guy, Greg Kokel. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then watched this debate yeah. on Lee Strobel's television show. And he normally gives each guy 15 minutes. He ended up giving them the whole show. Wow. And Kuko went back and forth using all of his techniques, which I didn't know were techniques then. I just was watching this. Utterly fascinated because in a respectful, kind, but engaged and focused manner, he just dismantled everything that Deepak Chopra had presented. Mm. Everything. Not only his belief basis, but all of his questions about Christianity. By the show's end, it was like, I was overwhelmed. So that led me to think more about it. I, I want to study this and I want to help others study it. Yeah. So that's. That. Yeah. That's very interesting. I know it's, it's a, uh, it's definitely a deep, deep rabbit hole that you can get down, uh, you know, in the process of looking into all these different apologists and, and uh, maybe sometime uh, as we get into it, maybe we can get a list of some, I know you mentioned a lot of them in like your classes, but um uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to give that resource to people. But another resource is you did mention uh, that you have some videos and teachings on that. And that's from the Wednesday nights at Shoreline, right? right. So, so those are um, they're different from this because they're just a single camera on you and you're teaching. And right. then afterwards, there's like interaction with groups and stuff like that. So it's a it's a different experience. But um yeah, it's a great resource for people if they want to study more in depth and have like some interactions with other people who are learning mm -hmm. about this right. uh, in the in the the after like the teaching and stuff. But um, yeah, I'm 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 excited to be talking about this stuff. I think um, you know as we we get into tactics and and what they are based off of of Kukul's book, um, you know, there's there's kind of a, a I don't know. I, I know Thomas and I were, were talking, you know, before the podcast and as we were just researching this and stuff, there, there's kind of a sense to me, the first thing that s stood out to me was that this feels much more like it's for debate and like structured, um, formal debate. And, and I think that there's, um, maybe that impression like right off the bat. And so, I, yeah, I just have, I have a few questions. I, I'm, I'm wondering, are, are there ways that we can take the, the ideas of these tactics and we'll get into some of those tactics, but really using them for like, um, not just that formal structured, like 
on a platform, like debating another right. in, in someone in opposition of you. Um, but is there a way to use this from, from me to talking to my brother or, or someone talking to, to, um, their kids in high school who are, are starting to doubt their faith based on yeah. the things they're learning or, or, um, you know, your grandmother, we we're making jokes about that earlier, <laughs> but, but is there, is there a way, uh, for, for us to be using these tactics in, in a way that's, um, more of a broad span versus the, just like on a formal platform of debate. You know, that's a great question because absolutely cool. And I've said this, I think a few of the videos in the ones that folks can mm -hmm. look at online in the class itself, I'm a counselor also. Mm -hmm. So I began using them in counseling, almost not even knowing I was, it wasn't a, you know, conceived strategy in counseling. I remember the first time I'm sitting across from a guy, gosh, months ago and He's saying, you know what? This is how this person is. And I said, oh, so, okay, I just want to, and I said this and didn't think tactics or coke or anything. I said, I got to understand this. I want to make sure I get you right. I need to know how you think and how you do stuff. So is it your view that da, 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 da. He said, yeah, that's my view. I said, good. So we got it out here. Yeah. We got it out here. So, okay, we're good on this. Yeah. And I, in my brain later, I went, man, that's right from Kukul's stuff. Yeah. You get the other person to confirm their view and put the pieces on the table. But it become natural to me because I've been teaching it and reading it. And it was a perfect thing to do yeah. at the time because I thought, wow. Now, since then, we've been able to refer back to the thing he said as a base to create new kind of tools and stuff from. Yeah. So I would say, yes, in friendships. Uh, maybe in that conversation with Uncle Bob you have once a year that drives you out of your tree, and now you feel like, you know what, instead of getting mad at Uncle Bob and hanging up, or him hanging up on me, I can ask questions now. Right. And I think the other thing that really helped me was Coco teaches the, the, the big difference between an assertion and an argument. An argument, sometimes we think about an argument as, argument, bad, 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 bad. yeah, yeah. But he's teaching it the way the Greeks did. Yeah. You make an argument in front of the ruling body, meaning you make your case. Yeah, yeah. So an argument isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I begin to think differently. Yeah, do I have an argument here? Meaning, mm -hmm. do I have a case? Mm -hmm. But knowing that an assertion, an assertion is not an argument, it just freed me up. Yeah. In all kinds of scenarios, like with an extended family member that tends to make these grand claims yeah. about something. They'll go, and it's this way, and the whole world knows, it, and everybody thinks this. Yeah. And I asked a few questions and learned that it was an assertion. Yeah. Ah, good. I don't have to get upset. I don't even have to try to argue. There's yeah. no argument to fight. Yeah. So once you know that, it's so freeing. Yeah. And I could be there and have a good time with them, and I didn't have to get drawn into this maddening mm -hmm. tornado that spits one or both of us out. Yeah, I know. I, I, uh, well, I, and I asked this question because I definitely, uh, you know, my wife, Mackenzie, she is my, she is like that thing, that conscience, that, that Jiminy cricket that's like pinching my leg when I'm in conversation with people. And all of a sudden it turns into like, Hey, like they didn't want to get into this aggressive, like discussion about this thing. And she's like the one reminding me like, Hey, stop, stop. Like <laughs> there's people here and they, they don't want to be involved yeah. in this. Yeah. And so like, I, I, I know that I can tend to be that way, whether it's, you know, apologetics or, or anything. I mean, if there's any discussion about, you know, politics or, or, you know, silly things about the shows that we're watching, you know, uh, and I just know that that can be, a uh, a tempting thing for me um, mm -hmm. to to allow these these ideas of these tactics to to give me um, permission to be like inappropriate in like social constructs or or in conversations with friends or or, right. or family members or whatever that means. So that it's helpful to to just kind of put the perspective of like, okay, it doesn't have to be these um, really. Uh, heady, aggressive debate tactics. No. Uh, it can be these tactics that you can subtly use in conversations and, and to know whether or not to engage, to know right. whether or not, you know, it's, that's, that's been, 
uh, a question I've been having as I've been like, uh, you know, doing some studying of this and listening to your, your, um, class. I've, I've been just, uh, kind of watching the videos and stuff and trying to grasp this a little better, but that was something that I, I it kept coming up to me over and over again. So, uh, it's helpful to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Good. So for me also, Cole, I appreciate what you're saying because even though the words used in tactics in the book are specific, mm -hmm. it's really the principle of the questions that we have to grasp. Mm -hmm. You have to say it exactly the way Coco does or the way yeah. I might. Yeah. So everybody's free to say, to, to ask the questions that he presents as a tactic yeah. in the way that suits them, that fits their personality. Yeah. And that freedom to just kind of be you and still get to the essence of the questions and the conversation you're aiming for is so helpful. Right. See, because when I when I look at the professional apologists, when they're in their thing, or even when Dr. Darrell would come here every right, summer, yeah, yeah. president of Phoenix Seminary, and a big highlight was, ask Dr. Darrell. Yeah. And if you notice, the questions are pretty much the same questions yeah. every year. Yeah. But he would give the answer. And for the first few years that he did that, we were all sort of amazed how does he know all this right, stuff? Right. And you could walk away from that and think, well, I'll never be an apologist. I'll <laughs> never be like that because I could never memorize all that stuff. And what Coco said is, well, you don't have to be that. Yeah. All you have to do is be somebody who knows to ask questions, how to ask questions and have a good conversation. Yeah. So that really opened the door for me to want to teach it. Because, you know, the the standard I use for people is if I can do it, anyone on the planet can do it. Right. Because I'm just mediocre at so many things but you can be mediocre as i am at this and still get some conversations going that you might yeah. have missed before yeah and the other thing i don't want to do is learn these kinds of things and then see them as you know tools to gain advantage over people yeah or tools to manipulate right and I have boundary cards that I hand out in the counseling practice, yeah, yeah, just yeah. stuff I've developed over the years. And I tell people, now now that you're learning the way to set a boundary, you don't go out and bludgeon people around you yeah. <laughs> with your new with boundaries. boundary tool. Guess what yeah. I got? Swack. Yeah. And we're not going to do that with these tactics either. Yeah. Because the scripture calls us, in Colossians 4 especially, to respect and gentleness. So does 1 Peter 3.15. Mm -hmm. And do this with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the key. And so if I'm thinking ahead of time, I might get into some of these tactics, given the crowd I'm going to hang out with right. tonight. I don't know. I'm going to ask God, you know, gentle my heart. Yeah. Don't make it about winning or getting over these people. Because yeah. if I do that, we're both going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely that, that the truth and love um, concept. Because, you know, truthfully you would hate to become that like who, who'd you the hypothetical like uncle joe at the dinner you know yeah. where nobody like everyone wants to avoid him and he's making the assertions like you'd hate for people to make that assumption about you and so there's that like that healthy balance of that like right gentleness and kindness and 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 truth and love and you can't separate yep. them yeah and even if you're that person who does have a mind that just absorbs knowledge base mm -hmm. like you really are getting all the stuff that you can defeat a skeptic or answer a skeptic i mean, I mean defeat someone in debate or answer a right, skeptic right. if you just start trotting that out guess what you sound like you sound like the the, the party know-it-all yeah and who do people want to avoid at a party? A know-it-all. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk to a know-it-all. It's know-it-all. K-I-A, which also stands for the conversation is killed in action. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So you don't want to be that person either. Yeah. And the whole idea with apologetics, I mean, that, that helps steer it is, mm -hmm. why do we even care if this person is going to draw closer to Jesus? Why do I even care? Yeah. I care because we were told to love others and people will know who Jesus is by our love for one another. Mm -hmm. If I'm not motivated by love when I use this stuff, what's the point? Yeah. It's just another way to get over and put a, a notch on my belt. And yeah. I don't want to go there either. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so I, I did want to, we can jump into some, some tactics uh, here with um, just a, this discussion. I kind of wanted to move into... Uh, talking about some of the specific tactics and, sure. and um, 
I, I guess I just wanted to start by asking the question of this, looking at the book, he talks about the ambassador model. Mm -hmm. So can you can kind of just describe that? What is it? And, and lay it out for us. Well, an ambassador model, uh, I understand it the way Coco does, I believe, is simply look at the word ambassador. What are you? Mm -hmm. You're someone who represents the interests of the one who sent you. So whenever we're an ambassador in any of these conversations and we use a tactic, who are we representing? We're representing Jesus Christ. So we have to be synced up with what we believe he wants us to say and do and how he wants us to be, to be an effective ambassador for the kingdom. So as an ambassador, then I, I need to pray and I need to be ready and I need to be careful that I'm representing the best of his character and his nature as I engage in these conversations. That's my own understanding of yeah. it. Yeah, that sounds like it falls in line with the the truth and love, the the you know coming at these things with like grace and and compassion and kindness and um, that's good. That's good. Uh, so one another thing that I wanted to ask about was this you know the concept of being a gardener and uh, rather than a harvester. And right. I remember you talked about that in your in your teaching. And uh, so can you lay that out for us? Because I had a question about sure. that as well. Well, the gardener basically is is the concept of anyone can be a gardener, and there's just a few people who come along when the harvest is ripe. I would call Pastor Kevin and Pastor uh, mm -hmm. Howie, founder of the church, both harvesters, mm -hmm. gardeners, but also harvesters, mm -hmm. meaning that everybody else uh, who isn't a harvester is preparing the soil, preparing the crop somehow, some way, doing something um, to help be part of getting this person ready for the harvest. Mm -hmm. The harvest would be they invite Jesus into their heart. And I know I'm not a, an evangelist by gifting. Right. I mean, I share Jesus, and I've drawn a couple of people to Jesus, maybe through sharing with them, but not like a gifted evangelist does. Yeah. So I see myself as a gardener. So my idea through using the questions is, is in line with Coco. I just want to get that look in someone's eye when I feel like, there it is. They're thinking. Mm -hmm. Shifted the thinking a little bit. A little bit. Coco calls it putting a stone or rock in their shoe. If you've had one, you know when you walk away, it like nags you till you get the rock out. Yeah. So that's the idea is we're all part of that. And if you can see yourself as part of it and you don't put the whole act and finale on yourself, then we can really understand that any of us can do this. Yeah. Any of us are part of that gardening. And it's and it's important. So it 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 draws in the folks who previously to this kind of approach who thought themselves outside of apologetics. I can't do it. It's mm -hmm. not for me. It's for those other people. Yeah. Not so. Yeah. Everyone can be a gardener. Just learn a few basic things and you're a gardener. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I, 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 you know, in listening to it, I, I hope that people, you know, for clarification's sake, we're, what we're not saying and what you're not saying um, and what Google's not saying is that that the harvesters are actually, you know, providing salvation or they're the ones that are, you know, it's it, it's not negating the realities of the Holy Spirit and that it's just a different like um, uh, gifting that uh, is being fueled, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And so there's that. And then the I love the truth of the 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 gardeners and like the the connection with that to like the great commission right you know i i love that and it's it's a it's a reminder to me that uh you know while some of these apologetic things can be challenging can be difficult to grasp can be um uh maybe something that you're you struggle with um just because of your personality type or the the way that your mind works or or whatever it is but we are we are called to to reach people with the gospel that's coming from a person that's also like that like i i i'm interested in apologetics i love reading like i probably one of my favorite books is mere christianity and and i love reading tim keller and i love reading you know a, a lot of these really intellectual people but i'm i'm very much like that uh you know, the gar I'm the gardener, you know, I, yeah. I love interacting with people. I love expressing my faith and, and showing people, uh, to the best of my terrible ability to show them what it looks like to lead a Christ-like life. Um, uh, but yeah, it's really hard for me to like ask those questions, like those questions of like, are you, are you, are you saying that you're, are you curious about this? Is that, are you ready to receive like that's so uncomfortable for me. And like, it's so hard for me to get into these discussions with people. Cause I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. You just get, you get nervous, you get uncomfortable. And I, 
and that's what's really drawing me to these the idea of tactics and and it's allowing me almost a set a sense of confidence and yeah. uh more preparedness to to uh you know talk about these things and to have discussion healthy discussion about these things um but one one thing that i i really loved uh in a tactic that i um, will likely be using as we go throughout this podcast and uh, as uh, I will likely be using it in my life in general is the the tactic of just admitting like I'm unprepared for this I I am uh, you know the tactic of saying like look I, you clearly what I, what's that called when you say you clearly um, have a lot of knowledge about this topic and I'm really just not, uh, this isn't going to be a helpful conversation because I'm just not prepared for this and I'm not. So I'm going to do some research and I'd love yeah. to kind of yeah. hear from you, your thoughts about this. And maybe you can point me in the direction of some of the research that you've done and ways that I can learn from this. And that's something that I'm, I want to be clear about with you as we're going through this podcast is I'm, I'm going to sit in this seat as a student and as a, you know, someone that's like, you know, helping conversation go along, but I'm learning from this and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to learn from this. I'm excited to ask questions about this and uh, to push back on some things. And, and you know, I'm, I, that's fun for me. So, um, well, but, it's fun for me too, Cole. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm in your boat and it's maybe weird for a pastor to say, but <laughs> man, I get stuck on the question. Yeah. What do I say now yeah. to ready for Jesus? Uh, Kevin, yeah. <laughs> Kevin, get yeah. over here. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I feel like that. Yeah. So, and also the idea of, I don't have the knowledge. You know, in the Tuesday morning Bible study that I lead, and I mean, it's a grace that I lead it. There's two mm -hmm. retired pastors in there, a couple of doctorates, a couple of authors. Wow. And th the fact that they even come to the Bible study I lead is like, <laughs> makes me giggle. I don't know why they come. I just like, yeah. they're still here. And <laughs> they are so gentle. Yeah. One guy just got two master's degrees. He's hot to trot on Greek and Hebrew. Oh, And he's wow. great. And so they'll say, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dennis. <laughs> That word action to Greek is pronounced this way. Yeah. And, and and there's three other things that it means that may, you probably knew, but just forgot yeah. to put in. <laughs> that happens every week that I teach. <laughs> so I get this big slice of humble pie. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I don't have a great mind. You know, there's people, Nabil had a great mind. Yeah. And you meet these people who have great speed or great strength or a great mind. I don't. Yeah. Like. I, so I just need to learn the basic things so I can hold ground. Yeah. And there's so many times that I don't know what to say. So I'll say, I don't really know anything about that. Uh, I understand what you said. So I got to go do a little check and I'll get back yeah. to you. And the beauty of what Coco teaches is if you decide, you know, I am going to engage in these conversations. He never leaves you hanging. Mm -hmm. Like if, if a steamroller is coming at you. I mean, they're unrelenting. There's no room for you to get in. Yeah. There's a tactic for that. If somebody presents more knowledge than you have, you just quoted us, yeah. basically recited a tactic for that. Yeah. The idea is anybody can learn this stuff, so you, you don't have to be fearful of conversations anymore. Mm. Even if you don't know what's going on, there's a way to handle that. So I like the thoroughness of the approach yeah. as a process. We're not even talking about content yet. We're talking about yeah. the process of engaging. Mm -hmm. And so that's what appealed to me. You can teach it to anyone and anyone who wants to learn it can learn it. Anyone who wants to do it can do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I, there's, um, I, I have some quotes here and, um, uh, some of these quotes, uh, you know, we, Thomas and I kind of talked and we, and Thomas laid these out and, uh, I might be jumping around here cause there's one that's standing out to me based off what you just said, but I, we have some quotes from the book, um, early on in the book, the first couple chapters. And I wanted to just kind of read some of these quotes and, and maybe, you know, just th there's a question attached to them. Maybe we can just have some discussion about that. But one that kind of stood out to me as you were, were talking, there's this quote from it's on page 38 of the book. And it says, if anyone in the discussion gets mad, you lose. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a powerful thing to, to be reminded of, but it, it seems like a very difficult, um, reality for today, I guess. Uh, it seems, it seems like that is, is something that is becoming more and more impossibly difficult to, yeah. to, to have, um, you know, these, uh, heavy discussions, things, things that, um, I mean, we're talking about 
the reality is we're talking about eternity here, you know, like when we're talking about defending the faith. So um, I guess my, my question is, is like, is that possible to even do today? Or like, how do we navigate that? How do we help that process maintain peacefully? And, and uh, you know, why is this case? Why is it, why is that the reality that you lose if somebody gets mad? It's a great question. And it's true. And I, I have to do a cultural comment also. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that volume, high volume, yeah. loudness, talking over, yelling over has become increasingly present and even valued Yeah, in exchange. Sports talk radio shows have five people now that talk over each other. Hmm. Other talk shows, there's three or four people talking over each other. It drives me batty. Yeah. And I wonder why, why is it so popular? Then I realize, well, every show like that's based on ratings. Yeah. They don't get the ratings. The show doesn't work, so somebody likes it somewhere, yeah. and that troubles me yeah. because it's true. When emotions get to a certain point, we lose our ability to access the the information that we've stored up to preserve or present our position. We lose the ability to access this, access it. It's not unlike if somebody loses control of their emotions. I mean, think of Tyson biting off Holyfield's ear. <laughs> He hardly would say it was a strategic move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He lost control. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's a graphic example, but in smaller uh, examples or in a micro way, that's what happens in an argument because when the emotions rise, we're sensitized to that in others. Right. Our own desire to defend ourselves can kick in. And before you know it, we are into attack, defend, we're into act, react. And the calm, rational argument we put in our data banks isn't available anymore. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what about you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, you started it. And there we go back to this childlike fighting for position. Yeah. And nobody gets heard. And so you made a good point, though. We're, we're Christians, right? Yeah. So we have a choice. I mean, we could slide into that whole thing and say, I'm going to out-scream anybody who doesn't yeah. believe in Jesus. But I don't know that you, you, you browbeat or screamed anybody into heaven. Yeah. You know, I don't think it works like that. People just, people will bail or buckle or cower through yeah. intimidation. When it doesn't fall in line with the, the ambassador model. No, it doesn't. So it doesn't fit scripture. Yeah. And I teach that in couples all the time. It's called safety. I'll say, you know, when your emotions run high, I can see it in you guys. We got to throttle back. Yeah. You got to figure out something to do to throttle back, to calm yourself. Otherwise, not only will you not be able to access your best approach mm -hmm. that you've carefully, you know, structured and, and built, the other person will be less inclined to be able to hear it. Right. They can't hear it. They're too busy getting like, uh oh, here it comes. Yeah. So that's the negative argument side mm -hmm. as opposed from building a, a calm, rational case. Yeah. And so we have to be sensitized to that in these conversations if we enter in. If I'm starting to lose it or it feels like they're losing it. We got to have an exit strategy. We got to have some way to throttle back out of that. Because even if it's tempting to stay there and duke it out, mm -hmm. you know, like I got more bullets in my bandolier than you got in yours, <laughs> it's human nature. Yeah. Yeah. The end goal doesn't happen. Even if you win, both lose. Yeah. And the kingdom loses. Yeah. Amen. I know you, we, we've talked, you know, just in the past, you and I just talking about, conversations and difficult conversations, leadership, um, uh, and something that you've said, and I, I don't know if this is an original idea from you, um, uh, but you always talked about like switching your R's, your react yeah. and respond. Right. Um, it, so like there's a true difference to those words of, of reacting to something that is coming towards you yeah. or responding to something that's, that's going right. to And that's been a, that's been a helpful, I guess it's a tactic, uh, for, for me to going into, conversations uh, regardless of what they're about it's it that idea has really helped me um prepare my mind and prepare my heart for um difficult conversations or or um even discussions about yeah. things like apologetics so um yeah getting a hold of yourself is yeah. less popular than it once was but never more <laughs> important than it is now yeah i know like get a hold yeah. of yourself and that see the, the whole thing too is uh with instinctive reactions, when you don't stick a wedge in there somehow to give yourself space to calm down, mm -hmm. then you're not your best self. And the outcome you wanted uh, won't happen. 
And if you stay engaged, we really shift agendas from the ambassador over to personal. Yeah. I'm going to beat you now. Yeah. That doesn't serve the kingdom at all. You might win, but now it's my agenda. And I got to, I got to always be mindful of that as best I can. Wait, wait, wait. Who, whose agenda am I working on here? Mm-hmm. Am I working on God's through Scripture? Or am I working mm-hmm. on my own? Because I just like to win. Yeah. Or, or I took a blow and I'm not going to put up with it. Yeah. Or personalizing things, people say. I think the whole Christian thing is stupid. Yeah. I got a buddy who will sock somebody if they say it. It's like, what, well, are you going to sock them into heaven? I mean, <laughs> what, are you going to bludge them? That's I mean, not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, well, they made me mad. <laughs> And if you love Jesus, you sock people who yeah. say bad things. No, it's 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 a tough like yeah. You know it it's get a hold of yourself. It's it, it's so hard. I mean, I say this, and uh, maybe this is just me, and I'm uniquely angry. But like things get really frustrating when when you when you're having these conversations, especially like as a Christian, like you're talking about like my faith. It's like you're pushing back on me on my yeah. faith, and it just. It's really easy for that to be an emotional thing for a lot of people. I think, I think maybe, uh, you know, actually, Thomas, is that is that an emotional thing for you? Because I feel like it's not. For what? Like when some when you're in the conversation with people, and and maybe it's a it's a debate uh, with you know someone that's like um, in opposition to your faith. I feel like you have a, a certain personality that like lends itself to not taking that emotionally. Uh, I do. I yeah, do very usually that's one sided and I'll be about 10 minutes into the conversation and realize that the other person's furious and I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that's yeah, true. that's Fe- true. Feeding on their fury. Yeah. 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 No, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. I guess that's a different perspective I wasn't thinking about, but yeah. yeah, I just, I personally, I, I take it very like, um, you know, if there's, I've had conversations with even like really close friends that are not, um, I would say they're uh, agnostic or, or uh, uh, they're kind of um, apathetic about, mm. about uh, what is it? William Lane Craig calls that like apathyism. It's just yeah. like, you, do, you just like, don't really care. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so I have some friends like that. And then, and we've had discussions where they've had that pushback and it was so hard for me to not be like emotional, like they're attacking me because they're, they're, pushing against my faith and that's so personal to me yeah my yeah. faith is so personal to me and so that's a thing that i really have to be careful of because that's when i start getting defensive that's when i start reacting instead of responding or you know that's a that's a personal challenge for me yep yeah you know what i'd, I'd love to say you know it isn't for me cole and if you ever get as evolved as i am it won't be a challenge for you either <laughs> but i can't really say that <laughs> i mean i was recently talking to a couple of family members yeah about how they can get closer together. And one was saying, yeah, I mean, I was raised in the church, but, you know, I think a lot of it's stupid. And I'm sitting there going, yeah? Oh, yeah? What about you? You're stupid. You know? <laughs> I felt this childlike thing inside, yeah. like, all right, put them up. And then I realized, wait, you're a grown-up. That's not going to help. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? I go right yeah. back to God. God, rein me in here. Because, see, we never stop being human. And so we never become like a robot with this stuff. Yeah. We're going to have things that hit us deep, that yeah. trigger us, that bug the snot out of us. And, <laughs> totally. But if we're saying, okay, right now, God, I'm in a groove with you doing this in this conversation. Keep me focused and not get into my own stuff. That's hard, too. Yeah. Oh, focus. Diplomacy. Yeah. Over D-Day, I think Thomas wrote that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Diplomacy over D-Day. You know what's interesting about diplomacy is the the teams of the people uh, exercising diplomacy, the leaders of state, yeah. have teams of folks that talk endlessly for months before the leaders ever talk. Yeah, because you got to figure out how to talk to each other. Yeah, because there's things that can blow somebody out of the conversation, offend them, or whatever, and so. That principle is human. Those yeah. are governments, but it's human. So we have to be mindful of that. You know, what do I need help with if I'm going to do this? Am I, do I have a hot button and I can explode in a minute? I'm going to go use yeah. these tactics. Maybe maybe there's some other work you want to do first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I was, uh, you know, I was looking at one of these quotes and there's a there's something that, that struck me about this. Um, 
this quote from, where is it? Page 27. Um, it says, beware when rhetoric becomes a substitute for substance. You always know that a person has a weak position when he and or she tries to accomplish with the clever use of words what argument what argument alone cannot do. Yeah. So can you can you unpack that a little bit because I, I think that's kind of falling into what we were talking about. It's just uh, you know there are there dangers to you know these tactics that we're we're going through right now um, that can call, cause us to fall into that. Can, are, are there dangers to um, you know, us being flawed human beings, um, using these tactics. And like we we're talking about earlier being, it, it comes across, you know, inappropriate or in the wrong setting or whatever that is. But, um, yeah. Can you unpack that a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, we can memorize the, uh, specific sayings that Coco teaches. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one is, what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah. the second one is how did you arrive at that conclusion or how did you come yeah. to believe that? And we can begin to use those things as sort of bludgeons, as sort of uh, barriers to people. And we can do that. And they become just part of our, our um, as he says, rhetoric. Yeah. Meaning just something that you say to achieve a goal in a specific situation. Right. And we've lost the meaning of it, the depth of it, the power of it. Mm -hmm. And we've lost the, the true, caring, uh, inquisitive nature of it. And we're just throwing it out there to use it to knock people around and try to get where we want them to be. And, you know, that's the end goal. Now, of course, in a tactics conversation over time, we do have spe specific places we'd like people to go. But we can use these things to sort of, you know, manhandle them and manipulate them and, and, and back them into a corner because we want to be masterful at what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and that misses the whole point. You don't do that for to help people meet Jesus either. Right. It's probably more for your own gain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. emotional manipulation to help yeah. you feel better about you. And so there's a, a degree of humility that has to be part in every part of this that we ever use. Yeah. It has to be a foundational thing for us. Yeah. Is that, I guess, is there, are there, do you have any of your own or maybe there's tactics that I just haven't gotten into with the book, but um, on maintaining that? humility like are there tactics like even from like your counseling world of of how to maintain that mental state of like you know constantly being in in that uh, state of humility or when you're approaching conversations or when you're you know i because that can be something i think for many people it's distracting and it's a it's a hard thing to maintain on your mind at all times and mm -hmm. um when you're engaging in difficult conversations like this or things that you can maybe get emotional about or like we were talking about earlier um do you have any tactics for that well so, i i have tactics for maintaining humility absolutely um i don't know if coco would uh I think he would affirm this. I don't know if it's in his book per se, but yeah. it would be in my book if I wrote one. <laughs> and that would be <laughs> read a first chapter of first or second Peter. And it says, you know, he who forgot, you know, that he you know needs grace and forgiveness is blind and and uh, forgotten his his own sin. I mean, mm -hmm. we just we've we've forgotten it. We're blind and nearsighted. And so ever since I read that, I thought, you know, I, I have to be so in tune, and I would encourage anyone who watches this to, to do the same thing. Be in tune with all the weaknesses that others and the Lord have to put up with you and with me. Mm -hmm. And they do in all my, my weak spots. And the reason I say it, it's a little bit harder for men maybe, and I don't mean it to be sexist, but yeah. studies show that because yeah. a man's greatest fear is that he's incompetent. Mm -hmm. And that's ancient. So I don't want to appear that way. So th so this sort of bogus pride can pop in. Yeah. And I won't look at where I'm really not doing a good job. And I think in tactics, it would be important if you're not doing well, get out. Just say, yeah. you know, I, I, I yeah. don't really know where to go from here. So I'm going to take a break. I, yeah. I, I'm kind of stumped. I mean, that go detaching. ahead and say it. Yeah. 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 Get away and, and don't cover it and don't make it artificial. Yeah. Um. And then, but for me, the the verses I cited are most important because I look, <laughs> I look at me all the time. I think all believers should. Paul says to have a sober assessment of yourself. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean 
that you're not drunk when you do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it means to have a, a, a thoughtful and careful consideration of who you are. Yeah. And when you do that daily, you tap your own need for grace. And the idea that if you ever believe you're all that, you're sadly mistaken. Yeah. One of the dangers if, is if you get really good at this, people mm -hmm. start telling you how good at it you are. Yikes. That's really trouble. <laughs> Probably won't happen with me, but... Well... But, I, you know, you start believing that stuff, you're in big trouble. Yeah. So every time you have a conversation... Yeah. You just got to remember, who is it? This broken guy, me, mm -hmm. talking to this broken person over here. Yeah. See what we can do. That's... It's tough. Yeah. I was think remembering to the the idea of not separating the truth and love. Like you really care about the truth of what you're you're defending or or, or trying to support. Mm -hmm. you, you you know it's it's something that's really important to you. But to remember to do that in love, I, I that that's a big thing that I'm sensing with some of these tactics is while some of them can be very aggressive and and forward and blunt, but some of the the, the principle of a lot of them is just. It's not helpful to to be frustrated. It's not helpful for other people to be receiving this thing that you really care about, this thing that you're really um, invested in. They're not going to see your way if you're poking and prodding and bothering. That's right. And, and and so I I there's a beautiful you know that's an organic outreach thing. I mean yeah, that's 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 a that's just being a kind loving person and right. saying like I I care about what I'm saying, but I also care about um, you knowing this and understanding mm -hmm. this. And um, yeah, I think that's a, right. it's interesting. And some of the roadblocks uh, you just cited, there's more I'm thinking of right now. And that is what, when someone decides they want to use a hammer, I just, you know, I'm going to tell you how it is. You're obviously mm -hmm. ignorant. I'm, I'm going to use that hammer. Um, when we, that, that uh, tendency of folks to do that then builds a defense system around it. So if they're using a hammer, we say, you know, you're, you're pretty hard on them. You know, mm -hmm. give them room to breathe. Hey, they need to listen. Mm -hmm. Well, the way you're doing it might prevent them from listening. Well, it shouldn't. Yeah. And when you attach, well, it shouldn't or it should to anything that you're doing, it shows you're not humble. Yeah. That you're stuck in a prideful way and you're not being effective and you're blaming everyone else yeah, for it. Yeah, you're implying that they're wrong. Like yeah. they're wrong. Yeah. You, you claimed a high moral ground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you've so I I would say the whole thing's off. You're better just go get a sandwich, get out, <laughs> go somewhere else, go for a walk. What sandwich would you get? I would get um <laughs> I I would get a turkey with pickle, sour. Sweet pickles aren't really pickles. Okay. Yeah. yeah they shouldn't be called pickles. They shouldn't be. They're an abomination to the pickle sure, community. It's scriptural. Yeah. <laughs> and a sour pickle with a nice mayo, only best foods. Yeah. And a crisp iceberg lettuce. And maybe a dash of mustard. That's See, the sandwich I would get when I'm bailing out of a conversation. I'm surprised that you went with turkey. You know, I thought you'd be chicken because you're bailing out. Well, no. Oh, oh my favorite <laughs> sandwich, fish. <laughs> fish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but you put that in a tortilla and you call it a taco. Anything so. in a tortilla yeah, is, yeah. is happy. Okay. All right. So I add another uh, a quote um, uh, here from the book, uh, uh, page 29. Um, and this one's very interesting to me. It says, uh, uh, this happens all the time, of course, on both sides of the aisle, we trot out our pet slogans, whether secular ones or Christian ones, letting our catchphrases do the work that careful, thoughtful conversations should be doing instead. So the habit of, uh, excuse me, uh, the habit often obscures the full significance or ramifications in this case of our words. And so the question here for, for you, Dennis, is, is What's the danger of falling into uh, this kind of sloganism when we're defending our faith? What's the danger of of allowing you know this this pocketed slogan that we just throw out there uh, for that being the the thing that we're using, the tag right. that we're using? What's the danger of that? Well, I got to tell you, an image popped up in my mind. I don't know how this is going to go over. <laughs> okay, good. this is good stuff. <laughs> it's uh, Seinfeld. Okay, it's Putty and Elaine. Okay, Her really quick, party. really quick. I got to be very upfront and say I did not grow up watching Seinfeld. So this Thomas, might did you? Did, Thomas, did you? Uh, I I think I watched the last finale series uh, episode. <laughs> was the only episode I ever watched live. 
uh, since it's only been rerun. Okay, well, I'm sure this is going to uh, land with a lot of the listeners. So, okay, let me hear, listeners, let me hear, let me... if you <laughs> raise your hand, if you ever. <laughs> but Putty is this weird guy that just makes these strange statements. Yeah. And then he signs off on them, and he and Elaine are together, broken up together, broken up all day, every day. Mm-hmm. And he becomes a Christian. And at one point, uh, he's at her house, you know, it's early in the morning, and yeah. she says, you're going to look for the paper? He goes, you don't have a paper here, but I'll uh, I'll get the paper to the guy across the hall. You can't do that. It's wrong. He goes, well, he's not there. I'll just take it. I'll get it. But they've already had discussions about he's a believer and she's not. She goes, well, how can you just do that? He goes, no problem. You're the one going to hell. <laughs> and I laugh at this and I think... That's just one of those sayings he just throws out there, and we can get in trouble with that. We just we just have these sayings we we kind of etch yeah. on, on our on our call sheet like a playbook for a coach, and yeah. we just throw them out there. Yeah, and 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 the the sense of the meaning behind it, everything is gone, and sometimes they just make us feel better. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I just like saying this. This is pretty good for me to say it. Whenever Buddy brings up this, I toss it out. Yeah. And usually when we do that, it's not helpful. And often it's a, it's a barely disguised counterattack. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. One of the m- most classic disguised rhetorical statements is, uh, or, or forms is people putting an opinion in the form of a question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it isn't even a real question. Yeah. So what do you think people do when they die? <laughs> like it's a real question. Yeah. Yeah. And you use those kinds of things and it just alienates. Yeah. So that's my sense of it. Yeah, I definitely like, you know, that's a, that's a, uh, intended to be like a comical, like, you know, experience with like on Seinfeld, but like, I'm definitely, I, I've seen myself, uh, I'll say in my younger years, uh, yeah, yeah, back then, way back then, um, where I would, I could like buy into this idea, this like, this apologetic slogan idea big broad concept of of something um you know like take for instance the 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 blind men uh from all the different religions standing around an elephant right um and we can talk about that if, if that we lead into that but i i like i read that in mere christianity um i think tim keller talks about it too and yes, he uh, does. And, and so i uh I read that and I was like, I can get behind this. And like, I like, I'm going to go use yeah, it. I'm going to use it. And then I bring it up in a, in a conversation and I sound like an idiot. Cause I can't like, it's just, it, it became a slogan. It became yeah. like a, yeah. uh, this, this idea or this concept that I, I say like, I, I can get behind that. Like I subscribe to this, but I can't even really talk through it. Yeah. You know, I, so I, I, I'm wondering if that's, to me, that was a huge danger of that. It was like, getting all excited about something and then like not being able to really process it like out loud and like talk through it. Right. Well, just so people are aware, can you briefly uh, go over what you're talking about? I know the, I know what you're mentioning. Yeah. The, it's like a little, what is it? Parable, I guess. Yeah. It's say. like a thought experiment, parable kind of thing. Do you, do you mind? Oh yeah. Why, yeah. I love it. So um, if we want to know what uh, uh, truth is, Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the blind man around the elephant. There's, I think, five in the original story. Mm-hmm. And one ends up uh, grabbing the trunk. One ends up grabbing the tail. One, uh, let's go with four. One, the side mm-hmm. of the uh, elephant's body and one, the leg. Mm-hmm. And when we ask, what is an elephant? Well, the one at the front says, ah, an elephant is a creature that uh, has this long, you know, very mobile and and agile uh, appendage. That's what an elephant is, yeah. or, or it it can grab yeah, yeah. things. And the other one says, no, an elephant is a wall. Yeah, it's a giant wall, but it has warmth and a and you can feel things going on. Yeah. And say the other, oh, it's a tail with a bit of a brush on the end, or it's, yeah. it's this long thing with a brush on the end. And yeah. elephants like a tree. Yeah, and the idea is that the wise person comes along and says. An elephant is all those things. Yeah, They're yeah. all right. Right. So the idea is in saying that all religions are the same. All religions lead to God. They have an understanding of a portion of yeah. what God is or what, you know, yeah. But the point Keller makes or an apologist would make is, well, to even know that. Yeah. For the person who claims it, they would have to have a higher knowledge 
yeah. than all the other religions could possibly have. Any one person in those religions, mm -hmm. they would have to claim a higher knowledge. Josh McDowell would say that person is claiming equality with God. They mm -hmm. would have to be God to know that. Mm -hmm. The other thing they dismiss is none of the leaders and teachers of those religions believes that and does not accept the other religions. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's sort of a self created fantasy, yeah, you know that that doesn't hold any water upon examination. It just doesn't, right? But but you know what? It's a happy, fun thing to say, yeah. Or as Lewis terms some of these things as, well, isn't that a pleasant adolescent fantasy? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and the world's full of them. Yeah, see, that's the thing. People can say whatever they want. I think. I mean, I just went through it with some folks, right? And one said, "Yeah, our parent was a Christian." Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, great. Okay, that's great. And I am too. And of course, Krishna. And I said, so I said, stop. We're good. I don't want to know anymore. I don't want, yeah. to, I don't want to hear where you're going with this. But the whole idea is um, people can say anything they want. See, that's that, that yeah. assertion argument thing. People are free to say things. So what I don't want to do is if they say something like that or tell me a story like that yeah. or... My extended family's favorite version, the cosmos cares for us all. <laughs> I don't want to say cosmos. Are you guys nuts? Yeah. I want to say, hey, <laughs> I would, which I did say before it didn't go over well. We were at a barbecue and the barbecue was strange after that until I left. And I'm sure it got better when I left. I can imagine. The pastor's leaving. Good. Now we can have fun. <laughs> but what I would have said now is, you know, I'm curious about that. Yeah. When you say cosmos, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And they would have been fine with that. Yeah. They would have given me some wackadoodle <laughs> answer. But you know what? We would have been talking yeah. instead of everybody waiting for me to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It'll get you. It'll get, get you in trouble calling so people nuts. Talking yeah. out rhetorical <laughs> things I've memorized like yeah. they fit every situation yeah. is just not helpful. Yeah, it's been. It's been. Uh, that was a obviously a clear learning point for me when the that brought up. You know, I just finished Mere Christianity. I don't even think I'd finished it. I'd finished like that chapter. And I was like, uh, I just found myself in a scenario where I was with friends and, and we were sitting around a table and just kind of chatting and hanging out. And, and, uh, uh, yeah, it was like, I just threw it out there. Like when we were having this discussion, there's like this and elephant. It, it, <laughs> you can't, I was like, hang on, let me, let me go run and get my book. And like, <laughs> like, I, yeah, I just... You I mean, people need to hear this. Yeah, I... I, yeah. I mean, I okay, I, let me, in fairness to myself, like the the context of the conversation called for the me to bring that topic okay, up. Right. But I, I only subscribed to it as a slogan. Like, I didn't have the ability to, like, back it up with, like, any real healthy discussion. I just... Was right. Like, it made sense to me in my mind. And then before, like, before I had ever, like, said it out loud or processed it out loud to myself or, or, or my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, I, I just dumped it out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know how to, like, talk through it. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a, a concern for, for me as I'm, yeah. you know... You know, I have friends, uh, lifelong friends that are yeah. believers, wonderful people, but very much like that. If they tell me about someone they ran into uh, in today's mm -hmm. world, right. I stop by their house and visit, and we just told them, and I think, wow, those are all the things you said 30 years ago, and 35, and 30, and 25, and 20. It's just like slogans. Yeah. They just crank them out, mm -hmm. and it makes them feel better, and if the other person doesn't like it, well, too bad for them. You know, so it doesn't require any depth of thinking, yeah. processing, or consideration of how the other person got to where yeah. they are. That's something else that comes up for me, just kind of in my heart, is when people are adamant against the church, Jesus, Scripture, mm -hmm. and they say why, I can sense that, you know, there's been some wounding here. There's been some wounding here, and I don't want to approach them as just somebody that needs to be defeated in battle. Mm -hmm. There's somebody that needs to have a place for them to maybe talk about their wounds. Yeah. If I'm going to be engaged in conversations with them, I got to hear them out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting thing. It actually leads into this, uh, another, another, actually a couple of quotes, um, that I think it can be, uh, yeah, a concern for a lot of people and, uh, in the church. And, uh, you know, there's this quote from, uh, page 42, it says some believers, unfortunately, uh, taken opposition as hostility 
and especially in their view of sorry especially in their view if their view is being challenged another part of this on on the following page mm-hmm. 43 it says arguments are good and dispute is healthy and he goes on to say that when the church discourages principal debates and free flow ideas the result is a shallow christianity and a false sense of unity yeah and so i guess you know my my question would be is why is this uh, so important to rid ourselves, the church to rid ourselves of that kind of thinking, because, uh, you know, we, we have to be encouraging people to have healthy, good conversation. Right. Uh, and, and so how, how do we do that? Why is it so important that we rid ourselves of that? And then how does respect for other viewpoints promote healthy conversation uh, and therefore prevent good outreach? I think, I think when people recognize that we're willing to have these hard conversations, we're willing to say, I don't know that much about this. I need to go research this more and then have these, these, you know, I don't even know if we want to call it heated discussions, but like, you know, co- really healthy, strong uh, conversations about things we're in opposition over. You know, why is that so important? Well, it's really important, but I know why Christians fear it. Um, there are Christians who feel like if you allow any um, thoughtful conversation to happen with somebody else that has a really divergent view from Christianity, mm-hmm. you are contributing to their lostness. Yeah. You know, and so I'm not going to do that. Right. I always have to tell the truth all the time. Yeah. And that people take it the wrong way. I think that's not helpful. And then people personalize things. Mm-hmm. So it, it's funny how it goes that if, if someone, you know, there are certain believers that someone comes from an opposite point of view and says, I don't believe that. I think that God loves everyone. I don't think there is a hell. Right. People feel like, why did you just tell me I'm stupid? Why do you just make fun of me and my religion? That's a sense they have. And if you're like, well, the time out, that's not what's happening. But if they feel like it is, then they launch the counterattack. Right, right. And then everything's lost. And so I think there's fear, too, that if you, if you go too far mm-hmm. in having conversations with people don't, that don't believe Jesus, right. you're going to be pulled away. Well, it is true. I mean, these are some reservations people have yeah. about using anything like tactics. You're going to pull me out of my own faith. We know that all through Galatians and other parts of the New Testament, Mm -hmm. Paul warns people about getting pulled out. First and second Peter, uh, first, second, third John. I mean, it goes on and on in the New Testament. Why? Because the early church did suffer through a lot of different uh, assaults on it, assaults from within, as Peter teaches, and assaults from without. So it is true. Can we be pulled away? Yes. Mm -hmm. But... If we're in accountability with the Lord and with others, and, and we're using these things with wisdom and prayer, I think those those conversations with people who don't think like we do or agree with the principles we're sharing are really, really healthy. Mm-hmm. And I think they're loving, and they open up doors. You know, I was on a dive trip not long ago with a guy that had a great guy, by the way. Yeah. Really, I hadn't met him before, and we just had great talks. But finally, he goes, hey, I heard you're a pastor. I said, Yeah. So, of course, he wanted to trot out his working theology. (laughs) And he said, you know what? We're the same. You got to read this guy. And I'll just make up a name like Floyd Babadook. You got to read him because he says basically the same that you do about evil and darkness. Yeah. And then basically the same as what you as a Christian or whatever about goodness and white and the light. Yeah. And then he went on to say a bunch of stuff, and I almost snickered. Because I thought, well, isn't that the cutest thing? Yeah. <laughs> this guy just made up a bunch of stuff, and now you, this bright, wealthy businessman, have bought into it. Yeah. So I kept all those thoughts to myself, as mm. you can imagine. Yeah. So I finally said, well, so that's interesting. And I started asking him questions I consciously thought. Instead of saying, well, that's not the way it is, yeah. Yeah. I just said, really? Well, so how does this work for you? What are you thinking? Yeah. Where'd you learn about it? And I asked him a ton of questions. As a result, we exchanged addresses and contact information Mm -hmm. for some day, and I invited him to come down and go diving with me. But I could have brawled with him right there theologically. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Or or maybe I nurture the fantasy. No, he would have been mad at the moment, but in the middle of the night, the truth would have struck him like a lightning bolt, because that's what I did. I put the lightning Mm -hmm. bolt of truth in his brain, Mm -hmm. and then he would have come to Jesus. Well, that's... (laughs) fun to think <laughs> yeah but i don't think i'd ever heard from the guy again yeah so now we're connected 
Yeah. I can text him any time and say, hey, come on down, bring your buddy. Yeah. We'll dive. And his buddy's profane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think we've had a conversation about that before, yeah. His buddy yeah. like goes on YouTube and does all these dive trips. He's very good. Yeah. And there's like bleep, 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 bleep all through it. But I He said, bleeps him out? Oh, man. <laughs> well, <That's... laughs> when others film him, he doesn't bleep his yeah. own. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the selfies. Yeah. But I invited them both down. Yeah. Love to die with these guys. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. You know what I mean? They're never going to hang out with another Christian, probably. Yeah. So, but I need to be in fellowship. I need yeah. to make sure I don't get pulled out. Yeah, yeah. So is that, but like, are they, do you feel, I mean, maybe you don't know this or not, but do you feel like they're they're willing to invest in you as a person uh, because you're willing to have these difficult conversations with them, or or is, are those conversations uh, continuing? Or have they slowed down? Or they well, they've slowed down. I mean, we lost touch. We'll have touch when the yeah. next dive trip comes up, probably. Yeah. And once I get you know my boat back in the water, I'll I'll text and say, "Come on down." Yeah. The one guy, yes, the one guy that wanted to give me his yeah his religion. The other guy just to have the uh, have the sense he doesn't really care about it. Apathy just likes them. killing things yeah. underwater. Yeah. And that's... <laughs> Probably is religion. Yeah. You know, people say, that's my church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd yeah. be one of those guys. Yeah. That's my church. That's my church. Yeah. <laughs> Rock climbing and like, yeah, yeah. And I don't like argue that. with him and say, no, it's not. Don't say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You got you to gotta connect with people to open doors. Yeah. yeah I know. I definitely find uh, that, you know, a lot of, and like, like the story about me, you know, doing the slogan thing and prematurely trying to express, you know, this this uh concept with some friends i will say though i'm very grateful for those friends because those friends that that still disagree with me um to this day about my faith and about their you know in the way i disagree about their choice to not pursue my faith uh i they were very forgiving they were very very uh um open to continuing discussion. Maybe it's because they thought they were going to win like they did in the moment when <laughs> I totally botched that concept. But, but I will say like my willingness to, to, to talk to them about, you know, my faith in a, in a way that says like, I want to know what you think about this there. It just lent itself to having real conversation. And that's what they cared about in the moment was authenticity and, and a willingness for me to, go out on the limb and maybe make a few mistakes or admit that I don't know enough about that to yeah. you know have a healthy conversation. I, that to me is where, uh, you know, where these tactics really come into, uh, their own when it's, when we're talking about things off of the, the platform of, of formal debate is, man, I think a lot of people who are not Christians who are not, they don't subscribe to like our faith, the faith that you and I share. Um, I think that there's a desire to be around people like us when you're willing to say, I want to have healthy, uh, authentic discussion about what you believe and what I believe in and how they're in opposition. And that's okay to have opposition. Right. Right. And um, man, in the beginning of when we were doing the Romans podcast, that was a big topic that Kevin and I talked about a lot too. It's just like, we've got to be willing to like, you know, not like segregate ourselves on our, on our right. faith or our opinions. And we've got to be able to have healthy conversations with people and express, you know, love and kindness and, and patience and also willingness to have intellectual conversation. Yeah. I, it, it's to me, it seems so important. So I couldn't agree more Cole and, uh, the various people in the communities that I engage in outside of church and home life, like triathlon community and diving community, boating, mm -hmm. you know, my boats, I got to slip in the Harbor now and I'm getting to meet the people on boats around yeah. there and the Harbor folks and staff. Yeah. You know, I just think more and more, what happens when you ask questions? Well, Coco, that's a prime strategy. Everything's yeah. about asking questions. Mm -hmm. But it's not just get them to put their thinking on the table so you can slowly get them to drive, you know, take the roof off and drive their and kill their own thinking. It's about who doesn't want someone else to be interested in them. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants that at some level. And to ask questions that are done in a gentle and respectful way, and Scripture calls it gentle and respectful, First Peter 3.15, when we do this, isn't just trying to figure out what they think. It's expressing interest 
in them. And I think right. that's the genuine part of something that a person needs to check their heart. If you're just asking questions because I'm on a strategic mission <laughs> and I'm going to nail yeah. this sucker to the wall eventually yeah. Yeah. by cornering him with my questions, brilliantly executed as I've memorized them. Well, I think they're going to be on to it at some point. Mm -hmm. And it will almost feel like a bait and switch. You know, like, wait a minute, something else is going on or it isn't mm -hmm. just about the conversation. Yeah. But if you stop and ask yourself, can I really care about this person as I ask questions? Mm -hmm. That's going to touch them. And I think that's what we're called to do. Yeah. That's the love of Christ. So asking questions with real interest. And if you're not really interested in the other person, I would tell people, back away then. Yeah. Don't do it if it's not genuine. Because mm -hmm. it's disingenuous behavior yeah. to a goal, your goal, and they'll sense it at some point likely. They kind of like, well, you care about what I believe, you don't care about me. Yeah. We got to care about them. Mm -hmm. That's critical to this going well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey Dennis, I I don't I don't even know how long we've been going. It's I don't been either. it's been quite a minute. So it has hey, been. we have a we have a ton of other things that we're going to be talking about in you know as we continue on with this right. with uh, this kind of series of of the podcast. But man, this is uh, this is exciting. It's getting me thinking. It's getting I'm learning a lot for sure just in this conversation, but also in like preparation and stuff. I, I'm I'm very excited to see where this continues and and I appreciate you and the investment you've put into understanding uh, Kukul's book and this idea of of tactics and, and apologetics in general. So I just thank you for uh, investing well, it, that time and it's a joy for me yeah. and I'm now engaged in you know praying and thinking about and writing tactics to the next series of class, yeah. series of classes for next year. Yeah, which goes deeper and actually role plays how to how to uh, carry out responses to right. questions, yeah. you know, with some content. So I'm excited about it. I love doing this yeah. stuff, yeah. you know, and like, I'm that guy that if, if I signed up to do a run and I don't want to train, I can always talk somebody into driving me 10 miles out of town and dropping me off. And yeah. Leaving. Yeah. I can't talk myself into running from the house, but I can talk myself into running home because yeah. it's getting cold. <laughs> So, you know, I trick myself into, good... <laughs> into commitments. Yeah. So I commit to teaching these. Now it's like, ah, oh, yeah. I better learn this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so I love doing it, and yeah. I've committed. Yeah. So now I have to, which takes the pressure off. Yeah. Oddly, that's and interesting. It does. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Tactic of its own, but yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for joining okay. us. Thank you for this conversation. I look forward to, to our it. next one. Yeah. You bet. Thanks. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week with another one.